TP. Sven TPing it as well. They're gonna bring in multiples through the back door. Lilith's here. He needs to get the chase starts off. Kuman is here as well. They're looking for the stuns in a full face race. The damage is enough. They're gonna throw it. A Lilith's win. 67 minutes in. On the top, on the altar. And toss back in, it's actually just making it easier. Right on top of the Templar attack, dead for 105 seconds. I actually think that's the game right here. There's not much of a way you can fight back and back. GG, Grats comes out. Here it is, NIP, your style out of minor champions. Hello, hello, and welcome to Esports and 30, the show where we take a deep dive into your favorite esports. I'm Marissa, this right here is Nick, and today we've got more for your esports diet. As it's all about the star letter Imba, TV, Minor. Nicholas, I know you have feels about this. Yeah, you, you can always use more Dota in your esports <laughs> diet. It's like, you know, they have complex carbohydrates. Yeah. This is like the complex esports, you know, for your, for your soul. I guess, but people are on the keto thing now, Nick, and they just want to go all protein, so this seems like a lot of carbs. Which, which esport is protein? Ooh, Call of Duty? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would say COD right now, especially. That's for tomorrow. The franchise. Okay, that's right. We'll save it for tomorrow, but Nick, let's not spend any more time chatting. Right now, on the other side of these highlights, we've got the man with the best beard in Dota, Tsunami, calling in. So, let's roll. And Lasso, it will be able to connect. ES being pulled back again. He's got the Echo Slam. Oh, he needs to get it off. Face. Now, you come over the episode. Of he's going in, and he's got the TP. Sven's TPing in as well. They're going to bring in multiples. Through oh, the back door. Lilith's here. Ready. He needs to get the chase down. Kuhlman is here as well. They're looking for the stand in a full face race. The damage is enough. They're getting through it. A Lion's win. They, oh, comes back. they thought they were in Roshan. Zinku Barra strikes for Now the Doombringer caught outside the pit. They got the Aegis. Oh, 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 pulls him out. They work in the Aegis of the Chains. He home unwillingly repositioned. Three tower. The Hex is up. And now they jump in. It's a great back. But the Wukong commands the skill. And the RP catches now all of E home down. Three heroes without buyback. They can actually end the game right now. Secondary one, he should die. No PPD is there to help him out. Book is low on life. They're getting a little bit of spill damage, and here's your rolling ball to forward. Not kill off one of these meepos. Just one. one. He's too big out. Attack him! <laughs> that is too close. Oh, they now they it. jump. They broke the Lincoln Spear. The Pirates are from Longrata. So, keeping Tuscar away from the secondary the stun. Do they have enough? It looks like they do. Kuman is down for 100 seconds. Buyback is available. Now Mickey on the end of his PKB jumps in. The instant dead drop. He just the cleaved please? up the hill. He has the that, buyback. That looks like a side blade attack. Now Lil's on the run. He knows he can't get away. A quick fissure. But quote the spare staying on top of him. That's why escape is futile. Tiger finally comes in. Still giving it a shot. And now fire strike. Oh, he caught the back lines. He caught the Rubik. Zolbind is already up, and Rubik is already down. No buybacks available from anyone from an empty. The black hole is absolutely nothing. Miracle. He just needs to toggle his way out of this, and then infest. Another fire strike. Another control with the finger of death. Putting down our gym. The buyback will be there to get him into the fight, but then Jabuki's has gone, and now it's just Phantom Assassin. Oh, oh finding yeah. a nice initiation. They're going to try and kill oh, Inchalai right away for the four stabs. There's still Tombo to be able to follow up with the bro strike, though. Inchalai gets off his BKB and sprouts himself. Miracle can't cut through, and he has to run away from ASD who's playing on the high ground right now. Serious. Strike back strong. Tavo still laying inside that river. Is going to burrow strike out. Eventually forced out by Siler. Fuel Scepter onto himself. Miracle's only healed a tad bit. Not comfortable enough to go back into that fight. So he's just got to run away. The real knight knows how to wield a sword. He wants more of a fight. Lotus off to protect oh, at least at the moment snowball. with a double snowball stun. The battle bonds and rock finally connected. But how much damage does Windstrike got left? Fox is getting in the fight. Zion's getting his own no damage. More and they're adding the damage with a side of fist. They're all going down. Zion's an all for no Looking for the full rampage. Give it to him. He's going to go down as well. It's Kuman who takes the kill. On the top, on the altar. Uh, toss back in, it's actually just making it easier. Right on top of the Templar Assassin, dead for 105 seconds. I actually think that's the game right here. There's not much of a way you can fight back and back. GG, Grapt comes out. Here it is, NIP, your style out of minor champions. For the second straight minor ninjas in pajamas lift the trophy, but they're not the only ones heading to the Epicenter Major. Joining us now to chat all about Starliner Minor is Tsunami. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be back. Always enjoy it. <laughs> And uh, we're glad to have you. So we're going to start with the fact that this minor was a bit different than usual because not just the top team, but the top two teams advanced uh, due to North America obviously having a qualifier spot taken away from them. Mm. So having now watched this minor and seen the result, uh, was that the right decision? And how did it impact kind of the picture of this event? 
Seeing as how none of the top four teams had a North American team, I think that spot was rightfully confiscated. Two European teams ended up making it through, Alliance and NIP, and I think most people would expect them to, NIP especially, to be the strongest team going into the minor. And then a lot of people had a lot of expectations for Ehome and Mineski because these teams have DPC points, but it ended up being Alliance and they've been grinding their heart out and I'm really happy to see them getting a chance at this last major of the season. Yeah, well, let's talk a little more about Alliance here because just last week on the show, Brody and Nick were talking with Killer Pigeon about the potential of Alliance, and here they are making the major just a few days later. Tsunami, in your eyes, how much has this young Alliance roster grown, and how much noise do you think they'll make at Epicenter? It's been a very rough year for them. They at least had some gifts in the beginning of the season because Liquid was a little bit off balance and OG wasn't at full power yet because they didn't have Ana back. And so the European qualifiers were actually looking fairly easy. It was mainly just them and Secret and they were making it through. Even NIP wasn't too much in the discussion. But then Liquid came back and then OG came back and all of a sudden the European qualifiers got extremely crowded and Alliance got pushed out. And so NIP started becoming the go-to team team in the minors as we saw in the previous minor but now that the slot opened up alliance took it and i'm really happy for them they have maintained the same roster which is something that you can't say for very many teams this season and their coach loda who former player been working with them extremely hard and i'm sure he had the opportunity to maybe swap players at some point but he stuck it out and i'm really proud of them now you mentioned loda do you see a little bit of kind of like that old school alliance rat dota influence in there is this kind of like a whole new alliance that that people can learn to love in a different way I think it's uh, it's like an escape maneuver for they, them. Whenever they had they that have back to... door against Windstrike, they did. right? So exactly, and that's the exact moment where everyone was like, "You can, you can take the rat out of the alliance, but you can't ever take the alliance out of the rat maneuvers." <laughs> yeah. So it was really, it was a throwback. Uh, obviously, any lone druid player could tell you that it doesn't have to be a bulldog level strat. But when when the chips are down, sometimes you have to go for that. But it's not as uh, it's not as cut and dry as a TI3 alliance would be. They're showing a little bit more versatility, but it's always fun to see those strats or even some Luna strats come back every once in a while on that alliance. Perfect. Now our, our minor champions obviously were ninja in pajamas as we mm -hmm. mentioned. Second straight time through. Now kind of in between the last major and this minor we heard a little bit of turmoil around the team regarding their coach. So how did pp and company kind of work past that and become a team that could regularly top these minors? Mm -hmm. I was always surprised that PPD, well, for one thing, I was initially surprised that NIP did not have a coach at the beginning of the season because every team has a coach and it would be very, very odd to see whenever you get like the camera shot of the players sitting in their, uh, sitting in their chairs during drafts. It's so empty. Exactly. The, the entire bottom section is just PPD's brain <laughs> occupying the entire back half. And then eventually Clairvoyance came in and I thought that, you know, it was, uh, it, it probably had some influence. It's always difficult to tell without actually speaking to the teams what the coaches are bringing to the table. But the smartest players always have coaches behind them and PPD was kind of a, a holdout. So he took on Clairvoyance obviously worked out well but not well enough to keep him and then this time he brought PyCat on and PyCat was actually here again this same time of the year last year for the last Starletter Miner, the last Miner of the last season mm -hmm. and so it was that Optic squad with PyCat, 33 and PPD and then also had uh, two other players, Zai and I don't remember the last player actually but regardless PPD was defending his crown and he had brought PyCat along with him. Again, I don't know how much influence PyCat had. It was actually very amusing during the grand finals. I would watch Loda and PyCat just like chatting, very friendly, just even though they were out. just hanging out. And I was just like trying to listen in. I'm like, what kind of <laughs> what kind of high level strats are they talking about? And they were just talking about it like any other player. Just like, oh man, my mid laner, he's feeding. What's going on here? I gave him <laughs> such a good such a good hero. So it's it's fun to see that that uh, coaching influence and it clearly have pay, has paid off yet again. And then yeah. some former teammates bantering there and then Loda and Pycat, I'm sure so. Exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so then in your mind, what is the next step needed for Ninjas in Pajamas to not just be a minor winner, but a major contender and possible TI contender? So since the new patch just dropped, this was actually the first DPC event played on 7.22C. And while we don't know for sure, I think it's, uh, it's a pretty good estimate to say that Obviously, Epicenter is going to be played on this patch, which is the next major, but then TI is most likely going to be played on this patch or maybe a 7.22D patch. So just maybe, maybe very minor changes being made. So having that sort of competitive experience is a huge edge coming into a land like this. It was a big portion of the reason why we thought that NIP were looking so good coming into the Disneyland major after their last minor win, because any amount of land experience you can get against international teams will pay off. 
But at the same time, NIP are already qualified for TI. So the minor was just kind of a extra extra money in the piggy bank as NIP, I think I've like won the third most prize money in this season, despite not ever getting like any astonishingly high placements at any major. They've just been raking in that minor money. But I would be surprised if we see them go I don't know, top four is a tall order for any team. And NIP did better than I expected at the last major at Disneyland, but I still think it would be a far cry to call them major winner contenders quite yet. Okay, so, you, so you're, you're basically the, the scene right now is just so competitive at the top end, even when a team has like all the momentum in the world and even that bonus of having uh, like LAN experience on the latest patch, it just might not be enough to even push them kind of towards the upper echelon of our, your secrets and your PSGs and your VPs of the land. Exactly. I think maybe you'll be able to dethrone like maybe some liquid that might be having some roster issues, mm -hmm. maybe some new replacements, but still like the the upper echelon of Dota is so I, the gap has been widening mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously patches can change everything, but I still think it's it you have to you have to have a very, very strong team to be able to break into that upper echelon. Gotcha. So we touched on uh, Southeast Asia last time you were on the show, and yet again, uh, I just don't understand what's happening. You touched on, you mentioned Mineski at the top of the show here, how they came into this tournament with maybe a little pot potential, could have been contenders, mm. didn't even escape the group stage, didn't really get there. So with such talented players on this roster, because you look, just every position should be, should be solid, mm -hmm. what is causing kind of this consistent underperforming for Mineski? I don't know. It's incredibly disappointing. Just as disappointing as it was to watch in Disneyland with Fnatic and Mineski. Again, Mineski report, uh, repeating a subpar performance. That, it was Southeast Asia, NA, and CIS that failed to get top four. Meanwhile, South American squad in a, yet another minor manages to make top four. So it's really tough to say. I know I can kind of point a finger at KP. He did not have the tournament that I expected. This is a player who is a TI grand finalist on Newbie, but you wouldn't have guessed it watching him on uh, Mineski at this last minor. And then ultimately, I think it was just announced a few hours ago, uh, Mineski have dropped Ajit, mm -hmm. which I thought Ajit was a, one of their better players, but clearly the roster was having issues. They're not having the success that they should be given the star power of their players. So it, it maybe just needs a shakeup, but I'm glad it's happening now rather than them flaming out at TI because I know these players are capable of something better, mm -hmm. but they just need to figure out what's the issue. Right, potential is real with them. Um, okay, so complexity, despite being NA, is officially an international experiment with a coach and players from six different countries. What are the pros and cons of a risky strategy like this and why hasn't it really paid off yet for complexity? Yeah, so their most recent international import was Tavo, their offlaner. And I think that Tav is a very strong player. Granted, at this major, I mean, at this minor, they did not, again, have a very strong performance. To be fair, they did have some visa issues, and so they actually ended up flying in the day that they were playing their tournament. In fact, I think they flew in like, maybe like six hours before, which was also the true with Mineski. So that's another thing that you can kind of put in Mineski's favor as an excuse if you want to. Mm. But uh, the North American qualifiers are going to be brutal. Basically, there's evil geniuses up here, and then there's the rest of North America, way below. You got your J storms, your forwards, your complexities, your beast coasts, and they're all kind of fighting for this last spot. Evil Genius is obviously is directly qualified. The rest of the region are going to be having a hell of a time trying to figure it out. And obviously, the uh, more exotic imports of complexity are helping out. They have South American players, they have Southeast Asian players, and their coach, Kips, has a lot of experience working with Southeast Asian players. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that will bring them over the top. But North America is very unpredictable. Any one team can have a good day and any one team can have a bad day. It's just up to complexity to hopefully have a good day whenever TI quals roll around. Mm. So one of the things that I, I've noticed with complexity, but also just kind of North America in general, is we do see a lot of these international projects in some ways following in the footsteps of Evil Geniuses, who were kind of one of those first North American teams to bring over imports from Europe. Why do you think we see this in North America more than other regions? Although we do see it in like Southeast Asia, for example. I think it's, uh, you know, one aspect, one perk is that you get to live in North America and it's a <laughs> less competitive region. So a lot of European teams have been importing their own, I think players themselves, I don't even think it's been teams, but players have been kind of 
forcing their way into South uh, South America, and they can't cut it out, man. It's it's rough down there, and they think that you know maybe the internet issues aren't so bad, but it's pretty frustrating to have to pause like 20 times in one qualifier and turn what should be a one-hour match into like a four-hour match. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's kind of holding them back. Whereas North America and Southeast Asia, I think they have a, a more powerful Dota culture, mm -hmm. and so it's a little bit more enticing to come to these regions. And then North America specifically, I think, I, it's you probably have one of the strongest scrim partners if you get a chance to scrim with them with evil geniuses and European teams obviously you have a pretty good connection if you go on like Europe West and stuff like that so I think Europe uh, and North America has the advantage of having not a very competitive scene but it has a great foundation to allow competition cool so it's as much an infrastructure thing as it is a player thing which is that would be my theory yeah cool so one two teams here that the Chinese teams we got at this tournament eHome and Sirius both had some like old school Chinese players kind of leading the charge for them in Ferrari and uh, Silar. Now, just the other day on the show, uh, we were talking kind of in CSGO about how this like idea of old versus new, when we've got these games that have been around for so long, you've got old school players kind of bringing something to the team and then new style players bring something to the mm. team. Do you see kind of that dynamic playing out in these teams where like the veterans are bringing a certain play style and then the young guys are also pushing them in a different way? To an extent, but I think most of the older players, the veterans, are best suited for coaching roles or leadership mm -hmm. roles. Whereas it seemed like Ferrari and Silar, they were more just kind of uh, tools in the machine. They weren't necessarily leading their young guns to victory. They were just like, you need a carry player. I've been there. I've done that. I can do it for you again. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, neither of them really were able to do it again. And we saw some of the cracks that maybe they can't keep up as much. Obviously, Ehome obviously had their coach of Shao 8. And so there was a lot of potential there. But Sirius was mostly young, and Sirius did better than Ehome. So I think that uh, in CSGO, oftentimes it's the it's the older players that bring the leadership, mm -hmm. whereas in Dota, it seems that they're trying to bring more of the experience than anything else. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we touched briefly on South America Dota in the last chat that we had. And this event, we got to see one of the Peruvian teams, and Borghesa. So in your eyes, what separates Peruvian Dota stylistically from other regions, and what is the scene's potential? And the Burger Cats, it was so happy to <laughs> see them. Uh, it was three out of the five players that had done so well at the Dota Pit Minor, the last one. So they were on the Majestic Esports team then. This time they were on Anborgesa or the Burger Cats. Apparently it's some high level South American meme that's like the, the reimagining of I Can Has Burger or cheeseburger, okay. whatever it was, it was amazing. I had to I had to look up the Google Translate before I started casting some of their qualifier games. I love the logo, but, it's literally like, it's literally like a paint. Dude, it was so cute. They had the jerseys also. It was amazing. That's awesome. Uh, so I think they, we kept on saying it during every single panel, South American Dota is among the most aggressive types of Dota. It brings back memories of the South Koreans and MVP Phoenix, what they used to play as. And it never really changes from that. So their heroes, their drafts, the way that they play, it's always geared towards being very fast and quick and unpredictable. And sometimes the patch favors it, sometimes the patch favors late game farming. And so teams just kind of wait for the South American squads to make a mistake because mm -hmm. they don't have very much international experience. So that is one thing that kind of holds them back is that they don't have very many opportunities. The same teams usually show up over and over again as we saw three of the five players, like I said, same minor again, whereas the minors, the goal is to kind of cultivate these less favored scenes so but the same experience kind of go, keeps going to the same players hopefully it's kind of trickling down and they're bringing that experience back to the region but sometimes it may be kind of a crab mentality kind of thing and they're just like well i'm getting mine so i'm just going to keep <laughs> rising up so it's uh it's difficult to see obviously we'll have to wait until ti quals roll around because no south american squad i would be amazed if any of them were able to break into the top top 12 dpc it's pretty much just infamous that has the best chances at epicenter but best chances is a relative phrase and i find it unlikely so we'll have to see at ti quals which team will rise to the top Perfect. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time chatting kind of broader Dota picture because you hinted at it slightly before um, Liquid making a roster change. And it was, I think it was just announced this morning that yeah. Weeha has officially joined as the replacement for Matumba Man. Mm -hmm. So uh, right off the bat, how do you feel about this change and how do you think it kind of impacts the style of Liquid heading into Epicenter? Because it's very different players, obviously. Very different players, very different style. Weeha is a... Um, 
He's a polarizing figure, I think, to say the least. Uh, initially, his break into the scene, a lot of people almost resented him for it because he had kind of a like in-house in leagues. He would like there was one game that everyone commonly refers to as the We Fresh game, where cheats were enabled and he used it. But that's long behind him. He's refined himself as a player and as a person, but he's still a very feast or famine carry or mid, whichever role he's in. And so that's something that maybe Liquid needed because Matumba Man rock solid, but you would never really see him single-handedly carry a game. He would also never single-handedly fail a game. Whereas Weeha, he's a more unpredictable commodity. So at Disneyland, it would be hard for me to pick out which player was the best on Liquid, despite them making it all the way to Grand Finals. I would probably say GH, but that's just because I love GH and watching him play is fantastic. But it's something that maybe Liquid needs. is. They need a little bit more of that unpredictability. They need someone who can go, you know, zero to 100 real fast. Mm. On the other hand, it, Weeha is a player who I have not known to stay on rosters very long, yeah. whereas this Liquid roster with Matu, I think they had hit like 600 days or something like that. One, it was one of the like, longest of all time. Exactly, and it was the it was posted on Reddit that they were the longest of this season, with I think Secret being a close second or some other team being a close second, and then like a week later they drop them. And so it's possible that Liquid are just kind of trying to trying to juice Weeha for a TI win, and then maybe they'll move on to you know a post TI shuffle. But I have not known Weeha to stay on rosters for very long, and I don't know if it's just because he's trying to move on to bigger and better things, as we saw his brief stint on Chaos, or maybe he's going to find his home on Liquid. But it's a change, and it's definitely, uh, it, it's, it'll be different stylistically. I consider it to be more of a lateral move, but it's tough to say before actually seeing Liquid play. I mean, as far as rentals go, you could do worse than Weeha, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you, gotta, you got two of the best Invoker players in the world on the same team now. Yeah. I mean, it makes for a good team, right? I just yeah. wonder, like, what kind of toxicity he's bringing no, no, no. to the table. He's he's a good boy. He's uh, kind. We don't know. <laughs> what, we don't what? know. We don't know. Yeah, we'll like, find what, out. Like, what happens? I still want to. I want to sip tea, and I want to know what he's up to. But I uh, mean, maybe Matu was up to something. He got kicked, so who knows? Maybe he was the most toxic one. We'll find. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I, I'm I'm still curious about where he's gonna end up, but that's uh, yeah. that's a discussion for another time, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. fine, fine. You mentioned TI, and there are basically four teams here, kind of right on that TI bubble. We've got Alliance, Gambit, TNC, and OG. So, what can these teams do to actually ensure their place at the big show? Obviously, Alliance are looking the best. They mm -hmm. come into the major with a grand final uh, appearance at the minor. And now they have to be less concerned about eHome. eHome were top 12 DPC, still top 12 DPC, but they're not going to be able to add any more points to their name anymore as they have been eliminated from the minor and they're no longer in the running for the major. So now it's up to Alliance. And then, like you mentioned, I would say that Gambit is probably the most likely contender to be able to add more points to their name, but they have a longer road to climb. Pretty much any team that makes top six will be guaranteed out of those ones that aren't in the running for DPC points right now, but Alliance only need to make top eight, which is still challenging, but it's an easier feat to achieve. So I, I think that Alliance are the most likely to be able to make waves, but even then it's still going to be a hell of an effort and a hell of run to bring them to that point. Deep, deep in my heart, deep in my soul, I would really, really be disappointed if OG didn't make this this TI. Yeah, that's another like permutation that has a possibility. Obviously, this is the most exciting tournament because like after every single team is eliminated, there are like massive implications for the DPC and what happens and where the points go and which teams can get them. So it would be a like a, I don't remember what the percentage chances is. I think Knoxville had them, but it's a very small chance that OG don't make it. But it is a possibility, which man, that would be wild to not have a defending TI champion after wings. But that was a that was a different story. Yeah. Uh, Tsunami, that's all the time we have for you today. But as always, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to sit down with us and talk that good, good Dota. Oh, yeah. I'm loving how much you guys are talking there recently. You got that TI bug, and I'm happy to oblige. <laughs> uh, always fantastic to hear from an expert like Tsunami Definitely. and seeing that luscious beard. My God, is it glorious. Okay, Nick, we've got just a you few. Have, you have beard envy you I, like. I do have a little bit of beard envy, but, you know, I have to take care of that monthly, so it's fine. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Nick, we've got just a few minutes left, so obviously I want to pick your brain on something that we saw the other day, because NIP's PPD, who we all know is an outspoken guy, yeah. he posted, you know, that twit longer, 
Are you going to read? There's no TLDR <laughs> there. Where he really wanted to talk about what's next for the DPC, right? So now I guess I, I want your TLDR on what he was talking about. Yeah. So he had some suggestions for DPC improvements, like ditching miners. Yeah, so, so he thinks that, and, and I kind of agree that yeah. in a lot of the ways, the miners are basically a glorified qualifier for China mm. and Europe. Mm. Um, they very rarely are worth the effort and the time. The viewership isn't like that amazing. And since Europe and China are by far the two strongest regions mm. that attend the miners and North America, South America, and C uh, uh, Southeast Asia mm. almost never really have a, a realistic shot. So it's kind of a waste of time in a lot of ways. So okay. I can see where he's coming from in this angle. And plus, if we remove the miners, it's one less set of qualifiers to play through. It's a whole tournament less to play through. So maybe we can see these teams play in like third party events or regional events mm. instead, which would kind of free up a little bit more time for the top level players and maybe give a little bit of different exposure to the, the kind of the lower level players. Okay, uh, so shortened tournaments by seeding based on DPC. Yeah, so this was a suggestion he had and another one that I kind of like. So one of the main issues they're saying was that a lot of these tournaments are really long. Even the minors are like five days or six days yeah. and then the majors are could be two weeks or two oh and a half gosh, weeks. Yes, so it's just a lot of Dota and it's a lot of stress on the teams and a lot of flights and a lot of traveling. Um, so if they just seeded like a bracket, for example, based on the current DPC standings, obviously you can't argue with the DPC standings, that's just the, that's the quality of the team, theoretically, right? Um, and that would, you know, remove group stages entirely. It was basically a suggestion. Now, from a broadcaster perspective, I don't know necessarily that, like, you know, they might like longer tournaments because it's, like, more eyeballs for a longer period of time. But for from sure. a player perspective and from a cost perspective, shorter tournaments are definitely better. Oh my gosh, the cost for, to even house these teams exactly. is astronomical. Yeah. So, I mean, I totally this get This is a very point. reasonable suggestion. Yeah, absolutely reasonable. Another one is stronger restrictions on teams dropping players without compensation, especially pre-TI. Yeah, so this one was, I believe, directly kind of talking about Matamba Man, mm. uh, where, you know, he spent the, almost the entire full year with Liquid. Liquid decided to move on from him, and we're only like a month and a half removed from TI. You know, he could be, and obviously even finishing like top eight at, at TI is a huge payday for anybody, right? Yeah. So basically PP just wanted to kind of draw awareness to not just in the pre-TI stuff, but also across esports, like the lack of player security and how teams can just draw players willy-nilly yeah. if they feel like it. However, on the flip side of that is, you know, if there's too many restrictions, right? Like teams might be, you still have to let a team manage its team, right? You know what I mean? Like an organization has to be able to make changes if they deem the changes to be necessary, it, yeah. right? And if it's too restrictive, mm -hmm. then that can also be a negative. So the, the trick here is finding a balance between mm -hmm. making sure that the players are taken care of and their time is, is valued and their time is compensated, but also giving the organizations or the teams that want to make changes the ability yes. to do so. What's that price pull up to now? Uh, I didn't, it, it's probably, I, if I had to guess the final numbers, I don't know where we're exactly at right now. I think yeah. we're in like the 14, 15 million, but I think we're probably going to hit the 35, maybe 40 million dollars. Oh yeah. 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 Just, just you know, so like I said, top eight could be, could be, you know, six figures per player, so. Okay, sure. Just top eight. Yeah, that's a car and a half. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's move on here because I do want to discuss a little bit of these mods because obviously auto chess. Yeah. has blown up, people freaking yeah. out about it, playing so much. But so Valve actually created their own version, yes. right? Their own official version, which is called Dota Underlords. Right, but the creator of the actual auto ch chess mod came with an app. Yeah, so well. he, he partnered with a different company yeah. to create an app that is now available in North America. And obviously League of Legends uh, just released their own version as well of the Team Fight Tactics is what that's called. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of funny because obviously this has nothing to do with DPC, by the way. This is just a no, cool no. Dota related topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's pretty funny that Valve spent millions and millions, I'm sure, of dollars. They hired Richard Garfield, a yeah. very well-respected game designer, to come up with Artifact, and it was a total bomb. And then some dude just came up with this kind of the, the next huge, uh, you know, card game, strategy game version yeah. for Dota, right? And it's, it's kind of funny how things work out, right? Because Dota itself was a mod of a Warcraft mod, 3, yeah. right? It wasn't a game that was planned. It wasn't a game that was designed, okay. right? And so sometimes there's like that, this whole idea of, you know, Designed by committee versus designed by inspiration yeah. thing, right? Where and it's only fitting that Valve tried to make something very specific and it didn't yes. work, and some dude just put together a great game and a great concept and it's blowing up. So it's it's kind of that uh, forcing lightning to strike twice, yes, and yes, yes. here we see the modders win again. I mean, I just love the whole idea of you know the Dota fam and Dota scene itself because they are supportive and they've always been supportive of like that grassroots. Yeah, of no, somebody totally. small made something and we're gonna make it huge. Like, there's yeah. so much to that. No, absolutely. And like I said, Dota itself was a mod, so to see yeah. the scene really get behind 
this kind of creation of the community and yes. prop it up and now make it a huge thing yeah. is it, really awesome to see. So if you uh, if you like this kind of thing, definitely uh, support the creators, man. And if, if you see a cool mod in Overwatch or in Dota or anything like that, or in CSGO or in any of the, these games that support it, yeah. you know, talk about it, tweet about it, because, you know, maybe, maybe it could be the next big thing. It could, but does that mean that you're not playing Valve's version uh, of Auto Chess? Well, right now I'm playing the app version, actually. I'm... I'm Look, You're supporting? No, I'm 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 living that mobile life, right? <laughs> oh, Nicholas! Just, just for the audience, it's funny though because it hasn't gone an English translation yet. It's still the Chinese version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it only has Chinese voice acting, so it's just pretty funny. <laughs> but you're still into it, 100. Yeah. I'll have to check it out myself since yeah. you're living that mobile life. Listen, that's all the time we've got for today. But you can obviously not get enough of us. That's cool. We understand. We'll be back right here tomorrow. Zurich and I will be talking CWL Anaheim. Thank you so much to Tsunami for calling in. And thank you at home for tuning in. Check us out on all our socials at Squad State. And we'll see you next time.